Welcome to the book summary of The 4-Hour Workweek, Escape the 9-to-5, Live Anywhere and Join the New Rich by Tim Ferriss. The book was published in 2007 and weighing 315 pages. Forget the old concept of retirement and the rest of the deferred life plan. There is no need to wait and every reason not to, especially in unpredictable economic times. Whether your dream is escaping the rat race, experience high-end world travel, or earning a monthly five-figure income with zero management, the four-hour work week is the blueprint. The book's available on Amazon with the link in the description if you like what you hear. So without further ado, I bring you the book summary of The Four-Hour Workweek. The Four-Hour Workweek was turned down by 26 out of 27 publishers. My story and why you need the book. Whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it is time to pause and reflect. Anyone who lives within their means suffers from a lack of imagination. Gold is getting old. The new rich are those who abandon the deferred life plan and create luxury lifestyles in the present using the currency of the new rich, time and mobility. This is the art and science we will refer to as lifestyle design. From leveraging currency differences to outsourcing your life and disappearing, I'll show you how a small underground uses economic sleight of hand to do what most consider impossible. People don't want to be millionaires. They want to experience what they believe only millionaires can buy. A million dollars in the bank isn't that fancy. The fancy is the lifestyle of complete freedom it supposedly allows. The question is then, how can one achieve the millionaire lifestyle of complete freedom without first having one million dollars? How do your decisions change if retirement isn't an option? What if you could use a mini retirement to sample your deferred life plan reward before working 40 years for it? Is it really necessary to work like a slave to live like a millionaire? I'm not going to spend much time on the problem. I'm going to assume you are or suffering from time famine, creeping dread, or worst case, a tolerable and comfortable existence doing something unfulfilling. The last is the most common and most insidious. The goal is fun and profit. The perfect job is one that takes the least time. The vast majority of people will never find a job that can be an unending source of fulfillment so that it is not the goal here to free time and automate income is. Reality is negotiable. The deal of deal making is also an acronym for the process of becoming a member of the new rich. D for definition, E for elimination, A for automation, and L for liberation. An expert is a person who has made all the mistakes that can be made in a very narrow field. Step 1. D is for definition. 1. Cautions and comparisons. Reality is merely an illusion, Albert, a very persistent one. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. Money is multiplied in practical value depending on the number of W's you control in your life. What you do, when you do it, where you do it, and with whom you do it. I call this the freedom multiplier. Options, the ability to choose is real power. Once you say you're going to settle for second, that's what's going to happen in your life. And number two, rules that change the rules. I can't give you a surefire formula for success, but I can give you a formula for failure. Try to please everybody all the time. Focus on being productive instead of busy. The universe doesn't conspire against you, but it doesn't go out of its way to line up all the pins either. Conditions are never perfect. Someday is a disease that will take your dreams to the grave with you. Pro and con lists are just as bad. If it's important to you and you want to do it eventually, you just do it and correct the course along the way. It is far more lucrative and fun to leverage your strengths instead of attempting to fix all the clinks in your armor. The choice is between multiplication of results, using strengths or incremental improvement, fixing weaknesses that will at best become mediocre. Focus on better use of your best weapons instead of constant repair. Lifestyle design is thus not interested in creating an excess of ideal time, which is poisonous, but the positive use of free time, defined simply as doing what you want as opposed to what you feel obligated to do. And number three, dodging bullets. Many a false step was made by standing still. Action may not always bring happiness, but there is no happiness without action. You have comfort. You don't have luxury. And don't tell me that money plays a part. The luxury I advocate has nothing to do with money. It cannot be bought. It is a reward for those who have no fear of discomfort. 
I am an old man and have known a great many troubles, but most of them never happened. What we fear doing most is usually what we most need to do. A person's success in life can usually be measured by the number of uncomfortable conversations he or she is willing to have. What it is costing you, financially, emotionally and physically, to postpone action? How will you feel having allowed circumstances to impose itself upon you and having allowed 10 more years of your finite life to pass, doing what you know will not fulfill you? If you telescope out 10 years and know with 100% certainty that it is a path of disappointment and regret, and if we define risk as the likelihood of an irreversible negative outcomes, inaction is the greatest risk of all. What are you waiting for? And number four, system reset. The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. There, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. Doing the unrealistic is easier than doing the realistic. It's lonely at the top. 99% of people in the world are convinced they are incapable of achieving great things, so they aim for the mediocre. The level of competition is thus fiercest for realistic goals, paradoxically making them the most time and energy consuming. You are better than you think. Unreasonable and unrealistic goals are easier to achieve for yet another reasons. Having an unusually large goal is an adrenaline infusion that provides the endurance to overcome the inevitable trials and tribulations that go along with any goal. There is just less competition for bigger goals. Excitement is more practical syndrome for happiness, and it is precisely what you should strive to chase. It is the cue all. When people suggest you follow your passion or your bliss, I propose that they are in fact referring to the same singular concept, excitement. Adult Onset ADD, Adventure Deficit Disorder. This is how most people work until, I'll just work until I have X dollars and then I'll do what I want. If you don't define the what I want alternative activities, the X figure will increase indefinitely to avoid the fear-inducing uncertainty of this void. I believe that success can be measured in the number of uncomfortable conversations you're willing to have. Just as the words are inadequate to explain true happiness, so too are the words inadequate to express my thanks. You won't believe what you can accomplish by attempting the impossible with the courage to repeatedly fail better. Life is too short to be small. The most important actions are never uncomfortable. Fortunately, it is possible to condition yourself to discomfort and overcome it. There is a direct correlation between an increased fear of discomfort and getting what you want. Step two, E is for elimination. One does not accumulate, but eliminate. It is not a daily increase, but daily decrease. The height of cultivation always runs to simplicity. And number five, the end of time management. Perfection is not when there is no more to add, but no more to take away. It is vain to do with more what can be done with less. The employee is increasing productivity to increasing negotiating leverage for two simultaneous objectives, pay rises, and a remote working arrangement. Doing something unimportant well does not make it important. Requiring a lot of time does not make a task important. And what gets measured gets managed. Pareto's law can be summarized as follow. 80% of the outputs result from 20% of the inputs. Alternatively ways to phrase this depends on the context include 80% of the consequences flow from 20% of the causes, 80% of the results come from 20% of the effort and time, and 80% of the company's profits come from 20% of the products and customers. 80% of all stock market gains are realized by 20% of the investors and 20% of an individual portfolio. Slow down remember this. Most things make no difference. Being busy is a form of laziness, lazy thinking, and indiscriminate action. Being overwhelmed is often as unproductive as doing nothing. And it is far more unpleasant. Being selective, doing less, is the path of the productive. Focus on the important few and ignore the rest. Lack of time is actually lack of priorities. The best employees have the most leverage. Parkinson's law dictates that a task will swell in perceived importance and complexity in relation to the time allotted for its completion. It is the magic of the imminent deadline. If I give you 24 hours to complete a project, the time pressure 
forces you to focus on execution, and you have no choice but to do only the bare essentials. Identify the few critical tasks that contribute most to income and schedule them with very short and clear deadlines. Am I being productive or just active? Am I inventing things to avoid the important? The key to having more time is doing less, and there are two paths to getting there, both of which should be used together. Number one, to find a to-do list, and number two, to find a not-to-do list. In general terms, there are about two questions. What 20% of sources are causing 80% of my problems and unhappiness? What 20% of sources are resulting in 80% of my desired outcome and happiness? Who are the 20% of people who produce 80% of your enjoyment and propel you forward? And which 20% cause 80% of your depression, anger, and second guessing? Identify positive friends versus time-consuming friends. Who is helping versus hurting you? And how do you increase your time with the former while decreasing or eliminating your time with the latter. Identify who is causing me stress disproportionate to my time I spend with them. What will happen if I simply stop interacting with these people? Fear setting helps here. Identify when do I feel starved for time? What commitments, thoughts and people can I eliminate to fix this problem? Poisonous people do not deserve your time. To think otherwise is masochistic. You are the average of the five people you associate with most. So do not underestimate the effects of your pessimistic, unambitious, or disorganized friends. If someone isn't making you stronger, they're making you weaker. Remove the splinters and you'll thank yourself for it. Learn to ask, If this is the only one thing I can accomplish today, will I be satisfied with my day? Are you inventing things to do? If you prioritize properly, there is no need to multitask. It is a symptom of task creep. Doing more to feel productive while actually accomplishing less. And number six, the low information diet. Learning to ignore things is one of the great oaths to the inner peace. Number one, go on an immediate one week media fast. Two, develop the habit of asking yourself, will I definitely use this information for something immediate and important? And number three, practice the art of non finishing. And chapter 7, Interrupting Interruption and the Art of Refusal. Do your own thinking independently. Be the chess player, not the chess piece. The best defense is a good offense. And we're going to look at the table now, which will show you the light gray indicates time available for high priority tasks. On the left, you'll see before scheduled email slash phone. And on the right, you'll see after you've scheduled email and phone. What you're trying to do is create time blocks to have more productive time within those gray. It is your job to train those around you to be effective and efficient. Create systems to limit your availability via email and phone and deflect inappropriate contact. Batch activities to limit setup cost and provide more time for Dreamline milestones. And step three, A is for automation. Chapter eight, outsourcing life. A man is rich in proportion to the number of things he can afford to let alone. Nobody can give you freedom. Nobody can give you equality or justice or anything. If you're a man, you take it. This is how email was meant to be. It's mail. It's not a chat service. And chapter 9, Income Autopilot 1. To create an automated vehicle for generating cash without consuming time. Cash flow and time. With those two currencies, all other things are possible. Without them, nothing is possible. It is critical that you decide how you will sell and distribute your product before you commit to a product in the first place. Genius is only a superior power of seeing. Creation is a better means of self-expression than possession. It is through creating, not possessing, that life is revealed. And chapter 11, Income Pilot Auto 3. Fewer than 5% of the 195,000 books published each year sell more than 5,000 copies. Customer service is providing an excellent product at an acceptable price and solving legitimate problems, lost packages, replacements, and refunds, etc. in the fastest manner possible. That's it. The more options you offer the customer, the more indecision you create, and the fewer orders you receive. It is a disservice all around. Furthermore, the more options you offer the customer, the more manufacturing and customer service burden you create for yourself. It isn't enough to think outside the box. Thinking is passive. Get used to acting outside the box. And step four, 
L is for liberation. It is far better for a man to go wrong in freedom than to go right in chains. And chapter 12, Disappearing Act. By working faithfully 8 hours a day, you may eventually to get to be a boss and work 12 hours a day. Liberty means responsibility. That is why most men dread it. It's too big a world to spend most of your life in a cubicle. And chapter 13, Beyond Repair. All courses of action are risky. So prudence is not in avoiding danger. It's impossible. But calculating risk and acting decisively. Make mistakes of ambition and not mistakes of sloth. Develop the strength to do bold things, not the strength to suffer. If you must play, decide on three things at the start. The rules of the game, the stakes, and the quitting time. Now that we're on a level playing field, pride is stupid. Being able to quit things that don't work is integral to being a winner. The average man is a conformist, accepting miseries and disasters with the stoicism of a cow standing in the rain. Would you like me to give you the formula for success? It's quite simple, really. Double your rate of failure. Only those who are asleep make no mistakes. In a world of action and negotiation, there is one principle that governs all others. The person who has more options to search for them. Take a sneak peek at the future now, and it will make both action and being assertive easier. And chapter 14, Mini Retirements. Before the development of tourism, travel was considered to be like study, and its fruits were considered to be the ordainment of the mind and the formation of judgment. One of the biggest self-deceptions of our modern age, extended world travel as the domain of the ultra-rich. This is the very perfection of a man, to find out his own imperfections. True freedom is much more than having enough income and time to do what you want. It is quite possible, actually the rule rather than the exception, to have financial and time freedom, but still be caught in the throes of the rat race. One cannot be free from the stresses of a speed and size obsessed culture until you are free from the materialistic addictions, time famine, mindset, and comparative impulses that created it in the first place. It takes two to three months just to unplug from obsolete routines and become aware of just how much we distract ourselves with constant motion. And chapter 15, filling the void. Man is so made that he can only find relaxation from one kind of labor by taking up another. It is critical to stop repressing yourself and get out of the postponement habit. Learn to replace the perception of time famine with appreciation of time abundance is like going from triple espressos to decaf. People say that what we are seeking is a meaning for life. I don't think it's we are really seeking. I think we're seeking is an experience of being alive. Outdated comparisons using the more is better and the money as success mindsets that got us in trouble to begin with. If you can't define it or act upon it, forget it. What man actually needs is not a tensionless state, but rather the striving and struggling for a worthwhile goal, a freely chosen task. I believe that life exists to be enjoyed, and that most of the most important thing is to feel good about yourself. What can I do with my time to enjoy life and feel good about myself? The miracle is not to walk on water. The miracle is to walk on green earth, dwelling deeply in the present moment and feeling truly alive. And chapter 16, the top 13 new rich mistakes. If you don't make mistakes, you're not working on hard enough problems. And that's a big mistake. Number one, losing sight of the dreams and falling into work for work's sake. Number two, micromanaging and emailing to fill time. And three, handling problems your outsourcers or co-workers can handle. And number four, helping outsourcers or co-workers with the same problem more than once or with non-crisis problems. And number five, chasing customers, particularly unqualified or international prospects, when you have sufficient cash flow to finance your non-financial pursuits. And number six, answer an email that will not result in a sale or that can be answered by an FAQ or autoresponder. And seven, working where you live, sleep, or should relax. Eight, not performing a thorough 80-20 analysis every two to four weeks for your business and personal life. And number nine, striving for endless perfection rather than great or simply good enough, whether in your personal or professional life. And number 10, blowing miniature and small problems out of proportion as an excuse to work. 
And 11, making non-time-sensitive issues urgent in order to justify work. And 12, viewing one product, job, or project as the end all and be all of your existence. And last 13, ignoring the social rewards of life. Happiness shared in the form of friendships and love is happiness multiplied. The best of the blog. Recognize that the only rules and limits are those we set for ourselves. Once you realize that you can turn off the noise without the world ending, you're liberated in a way that few people ever know. Any problem found in the inbox will linger in your brain for hours or days after you shut down the computer, rendering free time useless with preoccupation productivity. Be focused on work or focused on something else, never in between. Time without attention is worthless, so value attention over time. Develop the habit of letting small bad things happen. If you don't, you'll never find time for the life-changing big things, whether important tasks or true peak experiences. One of the most universal causes of self-doubt and depression, trying to impress people you don't like. It doesn't matter how many people don't get it. What matters is how many people do. Too many choices equals less or no productivity. Too many choices equals less or no appreciation. And too many choices equals sense of overwhelm. Not to-do lists are more often more effective than to-do list for upgrading performance. The reason is simple. What you don't do to determines what you can do. Kelvin Coolidge once said that nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Expect small problems. Life is full of compromises, and it is necessary to let small bad things happen if you want to get huge good things done. And last, living the four-hour work week. For those getting started, five tips. Number one, start small, think big. Number two, identify what excites you versus what bores you. And three, eliminate and focus on what excites you. Number four, stick to what excites you no matter what people say. It's your life. Live it the way you know it and is right for you. And number five, read the four-hour work week, obviously. And that's a wrap on this great book by Tim Ferriss, The 4-Hour Workweek. Look back on our channel for previous video book summaries and subscribe now to our channel for future videos. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, hashtag bestbookbits. If you like the video and want to buy the book, click the link in the video description to purchase from Amazon. Thanks for watching and I hope you learned a thing or two. Have a great day.